Well, I'm certainly glad to be here. I feel like I'm on Broadway. I've never had projectors and cameras and whatnot pointed at me. So I hope I don't become too anxious and uh, I'll be able to tell you the message which is mostly about science of this talk today. I had a very enjoyable day here at uh, the Thayer School of Engineering. Uh, the most the uh, fun part was my lunch with the graduate students and the professors. I want to tell you that you're lucky uh, to have these guys come here to train under you and work with you. Uh, and uh, the professors that I met, uh, uh, they, I think they know that uh, they're lucky. So uh, the students should enjoy being here as well. Uh, before we start talking about sickle cell anemia, we have to thank the people who worked on this project. This is Oleg Galkin, who was a senior, he was actually a research professor in my lab for many, many years, and now he works for a company in Los Angeles. Uh, Vai Chun Pan is still a postdoc with us. Luis Filobello got his PhD and now works for Shell, of course. And uh, Ron Nagel and Rhoda Hirsch are professors at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York City, and they're our connection to the hematology world. Uh, and yes, of course, money came from uh, NIH, this is the Lung, Heart and Blood Institute, the Welch Foundation, this is the entity funding chemistry in Texas, and uh, my own university. So today we'll talk about sickle cell anemia and sickle cell hemoglobin. And uh, I will tell you what the connection is between the polymerization of sickle cell hemoglobin and sickle cell anemia and the questions and the issues related to this connection. But uh, what I want to emphasize is that the process that we'll be discussing is the formation of these so-called polymers. Now, when I say polymers, don't assume that these are polymers like polyethylene or polystyrene. There is no covalent bond between the monomers. The monomers are hemoglobin molecules and they're kept together by hydrophobic contacts. It was biochemists who named them polymers and, of course, they were mislabeled. So, one thing that I want to emphasize is that in order to understand how those things form, one should study the whole physical chemistry of the whole solution and all phases which may appear there and particularly important will be a dense liquid phase. So, you see droplets of this phase in this hemoglobin solution and various representations of this phase. So, the main message is that if you want to understand at least some diseases you need to look at physical chemical mechanisms. You cannot just study the biochemistry, you cannot just study the molecular biology. You need to look at, there is a big class of diseases which have very heavy physical chemical component and studying this component may help suggest cures. So let's go ahead and look at sickle cell anemia. It's an inherited disease. About half a million children are born with this disease every year. The sources of the gene, there is three independent sources in Central Africa and there is one more Asian source which encompasses the central parts of India and Saudi Arabia. So disease is related with the mutant hemoglobin which is called hemoglobin S and the cells become crescent shaped and because they are misshapen obstruction of blood flow occurs and this obstruction may lead to acute uh, pain or then uh, also uh, tissue death and then organism death, so the patient dies, which is uh, not very pleasant, I would think. So uh, this is the disease. Now here is the molecular viewpoint at this disease. The mutation replaces glutamic acid, which is one of the amino acids in the protein, and of course it's acidic, with non-polar valine. And as a result of this mutation, this valine can form hydrophobic contacts with three other hydrophobic amino acid residues on the other molecules and these 40 member fibers from now, when I say fiber, this is something pointing in this direction and all the way to into Canada. I would think Canada is in that direction. Uh, so those are very, very long uh, fibers on this length scale. Now, this polymerization occurs in the veins when the protein is in the deoxy state, so the red cell comes into the capillaries carrying four molecules of oxygen. Then the oxygen is released, the hemoglobin undergoes a conformational change. The, in the new conformation, the hemoglobin polymerizes and stretches the cell and this obstructs the blood flow. So you can see that the normal red cell goes to the capillaries intact, it delivers the oxygen, but the misshapen cell 
obstructs the blood flow in the capillaries and I've talked to several people today that this is a slightly misleading picture. There is a very important consequence of this, but let's leave it with that. So we will start the process of polymerization so that we can prevent the obstruction of the blood flow. So we're not the first one to study the process of polymerization. Many years ago, so somewhere in the 80s, so this will be about 20 years ago, uh, it was discovered that the polymerization is a first order phase transition. And of course it starts with nucleation, where a small cluster of the polymer forms, which carries all the structural properties of the large fiber, and then this fiber grows. And it was also found that secondary fibers nucleate on top of existing one. So that's why this thing was called the so-called double nucleation mechanism. What is important uh, that uh, the important consequence from the fact that this is a first or the phase transition is that you have three control parameters. The control parameters are the concentration of the protein. This is the concentration of hemoglobin in the red cells. This is the solubility of the hemoglobin, which incorporates the properties of the polymer itself. And then, of course, there is temperature, but temperature is not a clinically applicable control parameter because human temperature is fixed at about 37 degrees. So you're left with two control parameters, concentration and solubility. And therein lies a problem. And the problem is that based on this scenario, a pathophysiology, a pathophysiological pathway for the disease was suggested that these polymers form, they stretch the red cell and the red cell circulation. And because you only have these two control parameters, this is where the contradictions come in. So if you assume that this is the pathophysiological scenario, you have the hemoglobin S is expressed in sickle cell patients, then the hemoglobin polymerized, this leads to vasoclusion, and this leads to all these systemic events that we summarized in the second slide. Well, there is a lot of contradictions. And the contradictions are the following. Identical twins and there is many, many papers, this is just one of these papers, have dramatically different prognosis. Well then, identical twins are supposed to have the same expression of hemoglobin. How can they have different prognosis? So they would have the same concentration of hemoglobin, and yet they have different prognosis. So there is something amiss with this control parameters scenario. Uh, again, patients with equal hemoglobin as expression have different prognosis. Uh, then the red cells, which have high hemoglobin S concentration, do not sickle faster. So all these clinical facts were discovered somewhere in the 90s, and they, a clear contradiction was found with this scenario. And it was suggested that there is additional factors. So this is the first thing is the adhesion of the red cells to one another and to the walls of the blood vessels. Then it was the deformability of the red cells, which was considered as an independent parameter, the activation of the endothelial walls so that they would become more sticky towards the red cells, the permeability of the red cell membrane. So these are all different parameters. It was suggested that these parameters, these extra processes are controlled by other genes. So they, they reflect the expression of other factors in the organism. Uh, actually, there is a paper that says that the sickle cell anemia pathophysiology is akin to chaos. Now, there is people here who study chaos. This was a physician who wrote this. He doesn't. He thinks that chaos is just chaos, a big mess. It's not. Uh, but he meant big mess. So it's very difficult to understand and to highlight control parameters. That's what he meant. All right. So this is where we come in. And uh, the thing is that there is questions about these extra factors. The thing is nobody has found how hemoglobin expression, how could lead to this phenomena. No other genetic factors have been identified. So these scenarios, they're being pursued as research and perhaps clinical areas, but uh, the evidence for their viability is not very solid. So what we decided to do is that we decided, uh, let me step back a little bit.